you know, uh, nothing gets better um, as you get older. Uh, we all age. Well, some things get better. <laughs> but uh, there, our body functions slowly but surely um, don't function quite as well. Um, ovaries are no exception to this, and uh, uh, the problem is that um, if your ovaries, as your ovaries age, um, they become less able to do what ovaries are supposed to do, which is to provide you with a healthy egg to help you to have a child. Now, people age at different rates. Um, um, some of us uh, uh, will, you know, look like we're 30 when we're when we're 40, and some of us will look like we're 50 when we're 40. And, and ovaries uh, kind of do the same thing. So sometimes, um, even among a young woman, uh, you can have ovaries that are not functioning as well as they should. The problem is, if you wait to find this out uh, until your ovaries are already not functioning that well, um, you may already be beyond the time where it will be easy for you to achieve your goal of having a child. So um, we uh, recommend that as part of routine care, um, the same way you'd have your pap smear or, or other routine gynecologic care, um, it's useful uh, to uh, check and, and see um, how are your ovaries are doing. And it's just a matter of doing a simple blood test. Now, um, obviously a blood test is not going to tell the whole story, um, but it'll give you some guidance and give you some idea of um, where you are. Um, the blood tests that um, we would use to just sort of look in on ovarian function um, would be uh, AMH, uh, which can be done at any time uh, in your um, cycle, or um, a baseline uh, FSH and estradiol in combination. Now, when I say baseline, I mean on the second. When I say baseline, I mean on the second or third day uh, of your menstrual cycle. We expect that um, uh, as women age, or as the ovaries age, that the uh, FSH will slowly rise. You can kind of think of that as. Um, uh, the FSH being the signal that your brain sends to the ovary to make it do its job. And if the ovary is less responsive, the brain starts sending uh, a stronger signal, um, it's steadily stronger as the ovary becomes less and less responsive. Now we have some idea of where that signal should be uh, based on where you are in your life. And if uh, it appears that um, the signal is coming out stronger than it should, uh, that's some evidence the ovary is not functioning as well as we would expect. So you can kind of think of it um, as um, if you have a curve in which the uh, FSH is steadily rising as, you, as one gets older, but you're already much higher than that uh, at a young age. Um, then, then that's a, a reason to be uh, worried and um, might uh, affect your plans for how you're going to plan your family, uh, family goals. The, um, uh, traditionally, the, that FSH, estradiol, timing it on the second day of your cycle, um, it's a little bit difficult because you might be at your doctor on some other point in your, in your cycle and then you have to go back and have another blood test done. Um, so in the last uh, decade or so, um, we've been uh, begun to use this other hormone, which I mentioned before, which is AMH, which stands for anti-malarian hormone. Um, AMH uh, comes from um, every small follicle in your ovary that's developing. Uh, earlier in development, follicles don't produce uh, AMH. Much later in development, once they start really moving on into the cycle and making eggs, they don't produce the AMH. So the um, AMH is coming from all those follicles that are sort of on deck, ready to come into your next cycle or two. Um, an average, uh, at any average age, um, a woman has an expected number of these small follicles coming into play. And again, um, uh, 
we have a we anticipate what your AMH should, level should be uh, at each age. We've published a few papers on this over the years, and we have a pretty good idea of um, where that level should be. Now, AMH um, begins actually very high when you're young and you have lots of follicles and falls down steadily um, as you get older. And so um, looking at the combination of the information from the FSH, which is looking at your uh, brain's and pituitary's response to what it thinks uh, your, your uh, ovaries are doing, um, and at the AMH, which is telling us more directly about how many of these follicles are on deck, um, we can get uh, sort of a two-point uh, correlation with uh, what your ovarian function is and give you a pretty good prediction of where among the population of people your age of where your function is. Are you acting like an average person your age or maybe your ovaries are a little bit less active than the average person your age or, or maybe even more active. So that's useful information. Um, again, that you can use in helping to decide what, how you're going to plan your, your family goals. Um, one of the tests uh, that we've been interested in for a number of years that gives us some guidance in terms of um, how your ovaries are doing is uh, fMR1. Now, fMR1 uh, is the fragile X gene. Uh, every woman uh, carries uh, a gene locus on your X chromosome that um, codes for this uh, fragile X. And in general, um, that gene um, has a certain length, which is on the average of around 30 units. So that the average woman um, who has a fragile X test uh, will find that um, it, she gets back a report that says 28 30, meaning that one X chromosome has a length of 28, the other one has a length of 30, or 30, 30, or somewhere within a relatively narrow range. Now the interesting thing, if you look at the whole population of women, is that there's a real peak that goes from about 26 to 34 that describes um, what the normal length of this uh, gene is. The reason why people test Fragile X um, is because uh, there's a, a syndrome called the Fragile X syndrome in which the length of one of these um, gene locuses extends all the way to be, say, 200 um, units long. And if you pass uh, a gene like that on to uh, a, a male child, um, that child uh, will have the Fragile X syndrome, which is um, a particular syndrome with some mental illness, um, a bit like autism, um, and uh, so we try to rule out um, that possibility by routinely doing this kind of testing. But the other interesting thing, the thing of more interest to us, is that women who have moderate changes uh, in that fragile X gene, um, not quite up to the point of having uh, risk of fragile X syndrome, but in um, a premutation range um, are known to have um, premature ovarian failure. In fact, fragile X um, expansion into the premutation range is the most common cause of premature ovarian failure, which means um, reaching menopause before the age of 40. So, uh, recognizing that, uh, here at CHR, we became interested in whether somewhat smaller changes in fragile X might also affect uh, ovarian function. And since we were testing all these people for fragile X anyway, for the reasons of ruling out fragile X syndrome, um, we started looking at all the data we collected over the years. And what we found is that um, small changes um, in uh, in the fragile X locus, meaning expansion um, from, say, uh, above 34, 34 to sort of the early 40s, which most people would still consider to be normal, um, have some effect on um, how you respond to ovulation induction, number of eggs you produce, um, uh, what your ovarian um, 
reserve parameters are, AMH, FSH, which we've discussed before. But the surprising thing, and thing that we didn't really anticipate, um, was that uh, changes on the other side, meaning um, expansions or CDG or fragile X locus length of less than 26 um, was also uh, associated with some of these changes. Um, the combination, meaning you have two X chromosomes, so if you have normal normal, uh, that is with between 26 and 34, that's a fairly, you're going to have fairly normal function. Um, if you have one in the normal range and one that's greater than 34, um, you may experience um, less function. And the same thing if you have one normal and one less than 26, you may experience less function. And we found that when you have both outside that normal range, uh, the effects are even greater. Um, it's a complex thing. We don't quite understand yet uh, what the mechanisms are. We've been doing some research that suge suggests that there are changes in the way um, uh, your, um, some of the mic micro RNAs are formed, um, and some of the RNAs are formed in people who have these slightly slight abnormalities. Um, and uh, we've continued to screen or continuing to collect data. Um, but um, one of the things we've uh, noted is that um, women who are coming to us um, with uh, significantly decreased ovarian reserve are more likely to have uh, these uh, measures outside the, uh, the normal, the absolutely normal range of 26 to 34. And so um, we've uh, suggested that in addition to looking at AMH and FSH, it's possible to look at FMR1 as a potential predictor of um, earlier loss of uh, ovarian reserve, which we've chosen to call premature ovarian aging. Um, and uh, others have called premature ovarian uh, insufficiency. Um, and uh, this is still ongoing work, but uh, we believe in it enough that we think it could be helpful um, as part of the screen of a young woman uh, to predict uh, whether she needs to be a little bit more vigilant in seeing how her ovaries are doing. Um, the interesting thing about it is the other tests for ovarian reserve don't tell you anything until you're already losing it, whereas this is a genetic test. Uh, tests. Um, it's a gene that you're born with and um, you could potentially predict uh, these issues uh, at an early age um, where you could still have a lot of control over what you choose to do about it. So that, that's the potential. This becomes important to um, young women who are um, you know, working on their professional careers who need to delay their um, their, their, their opportunity to have children until later to fulfill their professional goals. Um, and um, if you're in that situation and you're seeing that uh, you're falling a little behind your peers in ovarian function based on this kind of testing, you can think of other options like maybe changing your goals and getting pregnant or maybe freezing your eggs and saving some on ice uh, for the future. Um, but we don't like to see and, and what um, is, is sad for us is when people come back and, and they've done well in life and they've established themselves but then when they finally choose to decide that they want to have kids you know their ovaries are no longer there there to help them to do that and we have to struggle uh, with other things to try to help them along or in some cases they have to adopt or, or use donor eggs so um, the common thing uh, that we hear from people in that situation is, well, nobody told me uh, that I could be tested and, and, and that we could try to see these things. Um, none of these tests are 100%. Um, we see people with um, bad tests all the time who can get pregnant uh, on their own. Um, so there are, there are guidelines, um, but they can give you a bit of a heads up and give you a little better sense of control of, of where you are, um, especially if you've got your life sort of carefully planned out. Um, 
it can give you some guidance uh, and another point uh, to help determine what direction you want to go in.